morning, everyone. It's so great to be gathered together this morning. Let's worship our King together. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah.
Jesus, there is no one like you. There is no other king beside you. How good you are, Jesus. How sweet it is to be in your presence and to worship you, to praise your holy name. God, I pray that as we are singing these songs and these lyrics, that the power of the gospel, the power of what you did on the cross for us would change us, that it would give us life, 
Jesus, that we would live it out. And Lord, I pray that you would give us boldness to not hold it to ourselves, but to go out into this dark world and be a bright light for you, Jesus. I pray that when people encounter us, that they encounter you. So would you work through us, Jesus? Would we be vessels for honorable use, for your name and for your glory, King Jesus? Amen.
right, amen. You may be seated. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's, uh, it's great to see you, or it, it would be great if I could see you. It's a little bright. But uh, my name is Todd Pendleton, and I'm part of the team of elders here at East Point. And I'm here to tell you this morning about a class we'll be offering this fall entitled Bible Foundations. Uh, you see, as, a, uh, as an eldership team, we've really been increasingly convicted of the need to strengthen biblical literacy in our body. Uh, our foremost core value here, and uh, we talk about it a lot, is, is to know God. And the primary way in which we come to know God is through his word. In John 4, when Jesus is talking to the Samaritan woman at the well, he said, God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. We can only worship God in truth if we're immersed in the scriptures. We must not worship a God of our own imagination or a God that's fashioned in the image of our culture. We either worship the God of the Bible or we don't worship any God at all. So we're putting together an eight-week class. It's designed to help lay a foundation for biblical understanding. Each class will be about 90 minutes Someone told me a couple of weeks ago, Todd, you realize the average attention span of the American adult is seven to eight minutes. So this will stretch that a little bit, but we'll, we'll try and be gentle. Um, we'll spend the first class establishing our church's view of the scriptures as the inspired, authoritative, and infallible word of God. And incidentally, this was Jesus' view of the scripture as well. When he was, came to be arrested on the night before his crucifixion, he didn't resist but he said, all this has taken place that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. If the Son of God submitted to the authority of scripture, then we really should as well. After that, we'll spend three classes taking an overview of the entire Bible. We'll spend a couple of weeks in the Old Testament and a week in the New Testament, just providing an overview of biblical history. And we'll look at the, briefly at the different types of literature reflected in the scripture and we'll try and get a glimpse of the overarching story that God has written for us and see how we fit into it. After that, we'll spend the next three classes examining how do we study the Word of God. Paul told Timothy to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the Word of truth. So that will be our task, to learn how to rightly handle God's Word. We'll talk through the processes of observation, examining what the Bible says, of interpretation, of understanding what it means, and of application, which is taking that truth and using it to help shape our lives. And finally, our last class, we'll look at the, just the fundamentals of the Christian faith. We'll address really basic questions like, what's it mean to be a Christian? What is the gospel? And what makes Christianity different from other world religions? And what makes it different from the cults? So, if you are new to the faith and want to better understand how the Bible is structured and how to study it for yourself, please consider signing up when the time comes. Or if you're a believer who just wants to get back to basics for a few weeks, we'd love to have you as well. Our, now our goal really isn't just to teach, but to equip you to share these truths with others as well. We live in a culture that generally disdains God's Word, either through ignorance or through outright hostility. And so our goal is to take some first steps toward pushing back the darkness and shining the light of the scripture here in our community. And so now let's transition to our generosity moment. For those that have just been visiting for a few weeks, you may wonder why, why do they always have someone come up and talk about giving, but then Nothing really happens. Well, for those that have a little history here, you remember the chicken buckets? The ushers would come forward and pass chicken buckets through the, uh, through the rows, and people would give that way. Um, when COVID struck, we kind of walked away from that. Uh, now we just take a few moments each week to remind people that the ministry of East Point really depends on your generosity. As you know, you can give online or through the app, or you can give in the black giving boxes that are in each entrance to the auditorium. But we as leaders have seen God provide faithfully through some really challenging times. And uh, to those who have given faithfully, we're, we're very thankful. In 2 Corinthians 9, 7 to 8, Paul writes that each person should give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or out of compulsion, since God loves a cheerful giver. And that really should be our model for giving. We give out of love. 
if we're giving to God so that he'll somehow be impressed and give us a tenfold return on our investment through a raise or bonus or perhaps a discovered buried treasure in your backyard. Uh, that's really not the motivation that, uh, that he's looking for. We don't worship a, a cosmic Santa Claus who will promise to shower us with abundant wealth if, if we just stay off the naughty list. Um, we don't do that. We worship the sovereign and holy Lord of the universe before whose presence we would utterly disintegrate were it not for the grace and the mercy that he showers on us. And we should just be thankful that he has given us life and breath and the privilege of being a part of his great work here in southern Maine. Let's pray. Father, we, we praise you for the priceless gift that you've, you've given us, the, the gift of the blood of your son, Jesus. If we trust him and place our trust in him, Lord, you've promised us life eternal. We praise you for that. And help us, Lord, to respond in gratitude, giving back to you a part of what you've given to us and giving us a chance to be a part of what you're doing. We love you, Lord, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Morning, church. How are we this morning? All right, it's coming. It's coming. It's coming. Hey, I got a quick exercise. Turn to your neighbor and look at them and say, You can know God. You can know God. How many of us believe that this morning? Do we believe that? Do we believe that we can know God? I'm so glad that Todd was out here sharing about what we're going to be teaching through as a group this fall called Foundations. Biblical foundations. And as many of you, whoever here has built a home before, the first thing you got to start with is a foundation. And Jesus even said, if, if we don't have a foundation that is the rock, him upon which it's built, we're just building sandcastles on the beach. Because the tide comes, the waves come. When it comes to our following Jesus as a church family, our foundation is the scriptures that point to Jesus Christ. That's our foundation. That's where we build from. And it's so important that we, as a church that's on mission to make disciples, that we are seeking gospel transformation in Greater Portland, that we, not just the pastors or the teachers or the elders, that we build our foundation on the Word. And so that's why we're offering that class. That's why we're going after this, so that way we can continue to impact this region. And as you can see behind me, we have this incredible For Greater Portland cutout right here. Though it might, I, I hope it doesn't catch on fire. We're, we're a couple hours in. If you, anybody sees it smoking, just let me know. But we want everybody to know that we are for greater Portland. That we are for this region. We're for gospel transformation in this region. And we have a mission, right? We, we have this vision to see the gospel transform people's lives one life at a time or entire households at a time. But we have a role to play in our mission, and that's to be disciples of Jesus who share him with others. Right? We all have a mission to live on. We have a purpose for our day and our life, and it's to be disciples of Jesus who share him with others. And we believe that we have four core values. We've identified them in disciples of Jesus that are so important for us to take hold of. These values define who we are. They're fruit that bears in our lives if we're truly disciples. And so as we unpack these over the next four weeks, they might challenge some of us. We might say, man, do I really live into that? Is that something that's happening in my life or is that something that's missing? Well, that's okay if this is challenging. It's okay if it might sting a little or it makes us a little uncomfortable. That's what Jesus through his spirit wants to do in us every single day is make us uncomfortable for his mission and his redeeming plan for this world. 
And so we're going to be traveling through those values over the next few weeks leading up to Sunday, September 18th, which is Vision Sunday. Vision Sunday is going to be a blast. We're going to gather at 9 and 11 as we typically do, but then everyone gets to come back and bring a friend to our afternoon block party out in the parking lot. We'll have food, we'll have food trucks, we'll have bounce houses for the kids and the students, we'll have games, we'll have a canine exposition with our partners at South Portland Police Department, and I'm advocating for a dunk tank for Scott. All right, all right, you guys are helping me in that campaign. And so we're going to have just a blast as a church, and we can invite people to that block party with us. Because we have a challenge. Scott went over it last week as we finished out our Heartbeat series. We have a challenge. We're going to put it up on the screen here. And it's the Four Greater Portland Challenge. Super hard. Four steps. Grab a person. Choose a person. Grab a coffee. Share Jesus. Bring them with you. Choose a person. Grab a coffee. Share Jesus. Bring them with you. Now don't bring them to your doctor's appointment or don't bring them to school Bring them with you on your journey with Jesus. So many of us think that we can fly through and give a 30-second testimony and say, there you go, have a great day, off I go. Guess what this region needs? They need relationships. We need community. We need people that are investing in our lives. And the greatest commodity that you and I have today in this current cultural state is our time and our presence. Not presence from our cosmic Santa Claus, that Todd referenced earlier, but our presence, undivided attention, sharing Jesus with somebody over a cup of coffee. So pray for who that person is. Pray for who maybe that family is that your family can reach and you can invite them along. Invite them to the block party, but invite them to Sunday, September 25th, where we're going on a year-long journey. We're beginning on Quest 52 to go on a year-long journey in pursuit of Jesus together. And there's no better journey for us to invite other people along for, not just a sermon series, but an entire book and breakdown of some of the scriptures that point us back to Jesus, that we can discuss in small groups, that we can journey together, we can use in our chair time. We pray it's going to be a revitalizing season for our church as we pursue after the one who has called us by name to gather here in greater Portland. So those are some of the fun things that are coming up. But I want to go back to the little... The little gimmick I had you say to each other as your neighbor sitting next to you, you can know God. And I want to say it with all the authenticity in the world, you can know God. Think about that. Think about the reality that we can know the creator of the universe. Go stand out on the the beaches over in South Portland, look out over the islands and the entire seascape. Or head up in the lake region of Maine or the mountains up in the presidentials and look at all of his handiwork and we can know this creator. Also the father of our very souls. The one who knew us before we were ever named. The one who knit us in our mother's womb. The one who knew every day we were going to walk on this earth he's created. He has made us for relationship with him. And I'll say his purpose sole purpose is to know us. That's why we were created, to know him as his created ones. And so when we look at the idea that knowing God, our whole purpose in life is to know him. Our whole purpose, everything that we have, all of the career, the parenting, the the materializing, all the things that we think are very purposeful in life, which sometimes they are for a season, they are all, they all pale in comparison to our purpose as human beings, not as Christians, but as human beings. Our purpose is to know God. And if you're sitting here saying, who gave this kid a microphone? I'm glad you're here. Because today we're going to spend time unpacking the reality that we can know God. And I hope you don't doze off on me because there's going to be some challenging points here. There's going to be some challenging scriptures we're going to read from because it is a matter of life and death. Knowing God is a matter of life and death, and we're going to get there together. And so as we look at our entire purpose is to know God, I'll say the enti- God's entire purpose of sending Jesus, of saying, you're my one and only son, 
We're, we're cool with each other. We're in perfect unity here in heaven, here in eternal existence. But I want all of these people to be with me. I want them to have relationship with me. He took Jesus and in that purpose sent him so he could be the bridge that we would walk across to become relationship, to be in relationship with God. His entire purpose in sending Jesus was so that we might know him. Jesus taught us his ways. Jesus took our punishment. Jesus died on the cross to atone for our sin, to be able to pay the price that we could never pay. He rose from the grave so that we could have new life in him. He imparted his very presence, his spirit in our souls so that we can have the fullness of life. This is the reason that Jesus came is so that we could know God fully. And that is what we're unpacking today. And some people might realize today, maybe I don't know him. Well, that's a great place to start is the reality that you don't know him because there is a journey that he invites you on to know him. And a disclaimer here, going to church does not mean you know God. We okay with that? Coming to church on Sunday morning does not mean you know God. Memorizing the hymns of old, having a familiar smell of the pews as you walk into a New England church building doesn't mean you know God. Knowing God, hearing from Him, studying His Word, being in relationship with Him, that is knowing God. And so we're going to talk about that today. So Jesus himself said to his disciples in John chapter 10, some very profound things that we're going to unpack. And these things are so profound. I want to put another little disclaimer on them that unfortunately I didn't, I didn't pick this text, right? My wife earlier in the week was saying, hey, what are you preparing for? What do you get to preach on this Sunday? And I said, well, I get to pack in the reality that we can know God in 30 minutes. And she said, well, why don't you, why don't you use John chapter 10? And I said, well, I will. <laughs> What's in John chapter 10? <laughs> but then I looked and I saw exactly what she was talking about. Is Jesus paints these, this duplicitous picture of who he is for us as chosen people of God. And so as we unpack this, hang in there with me and recognize what Jesus has done and is doing in your life so that we might know him eternally. And so in John chapter 10, starting in verse 7, Jesus says to his disciples, Very truly I tell you that I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. Quick point, this is after they've engaged the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Jesus is pointing back to those guys, the religious leaders of the day, and saying, they don't know what eternal life is like. I am the gate. They aren't. They aren't the ones that lead you into eternal life. And so Jesus continues on and says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Notice that Jesus is referencing that he's the gate, not the wall. So many of us think, well, I'm just going to find my way into that kingdom by jumping over the wall, by getting through the the barbed wire fence by digging underneath and getting in. Jesus is saying, it's not about you making your way into the pasture. It's about you coming through the gate. I'm sure many of us have skipped a line somewhere or another at a theme park and it felt good for about two seconds. But imagine Jesus wanted to see your face as you go through the turnstile because he wants this relationship. The gate is what he's focusing on. The only way into the pasture is through the gate that is Jesus. And he continues on in chapter, in verse 14. He says also, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one Shepherd. Well, here we are today, church, in 2022. We, if we believe in Jesus, if we have entered into new life through Him as the gate, we are in the pasture and we are part of His flock. Is that not good news? Here we are as His chosen people. But my question is do we know His voice? He says, My sheep will know my voice. I know them and they know me. 
do we know his voice when he speaks to us? Is it a familiar voice? Is it the voice of a shepherd? And some people might be hung up on the fact that, did you just call me a sheep? (laughs) Any of us ever got caught in the thickets of this life? Any of us start wandering down a path that we knew we probably shouldn't have wandered down? Any of us had any close calls with projectiles in life that we probably shouldn't have been so close to? We sound like a whole bunch of sheep to me, right? We know what that's like. We know what our wandering and our, we think these, these, little, these little desires in our life that bubble up seemingly every day are, and we try to pursue them to, to completely vain, vain results. And Jesus is the shepherd that says, why don't you just come with me? We spent some time in Ireland a couple of years ago, and you're driving along these beautiful country roads, mind you, on the wrong side of the road, and you're driving along, and you don't expect to see 150 white little tiny sheep with four legs just all of a sudden crossing the road. So you hammer on the brakes, and they're all wandering, and they're all kind of freaking out because this thing was barreling down the road, and now it's not. And then all of a sudden, you see the shepherd make one motion and one noise, and they all turn, and they start following. And so let me ask you, When the shepherd speaks to your heart, do you look to him and obey him and listen? Do you know him deep enough that you can trust him with his direction? That these sheep didn't say, these sheep, sheep or sheep, these sheep didn't say, I don't know, maybe he's got this one wrong. I don't know, maybe let's create a little band and go off in a different direction. Collectively, they say, let's follow him. And do we as a church today know him so deeply that we follow him after we hear his voice as our shepherd. Because we can't know God. There is no way that we know God apart from Jesus. Only through Jesus can we know him. When it comes to knowing God, only through Jesus. And that might seem exclusive. I get that. They're not my words. I just happen to believe them with every ounce of my being. When Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to to the Father except through me. The language again, through me like a gate. Apart from him, we can't know God. We can't know the Father. And he has a way. He has a direction for our lives. And even in Matthew, he shares that narrow is the way and difficult is the road. Only a few will find it but it leads to life. That's challenging for us. Only a few will find it. It's difficult. It's narrow. Jesus is saying, yes, it's one person wide. It's as wide as him, as the gate, as the way into life. And so we have the choice whether we receive that or not, whether we walk into relationship with him. Because most of the American gospel that we can hear in our culture today is God loves you. He has great purposes for you. He has plans for you. Just do the right thing. Show up to church. Do all the things that are necessary so that way you have a good conscience before him and you'll wind up in a better place. That's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus says, turn from your wicked ways. Declare me as Lord. Receive my gift of grace and mercy that I poured out on the cross and walk with me into life through my resurrection. And oh, by the way, pick up your cross and follow me. And does he have good plans and purposes for us? Absolutely. Guess what his greatest purpose is for us? To know him. To know him eternally. That's his greatest purpose for us. And will we have favor? Will we have blessing? Will we see his spirit move in incredible ways that we can celebrate him? You better believe it. But will we also have suffering, pain, trials, and trouble in our life? Yes, we will. And like a father, we don't expect him to be a genie in a bottle that just grants all of our wishes and makes all the pain and disaster go away. Our soul actually needs just our father to walk with us through those seasons and to point out, do you see what I'm teaching you here? Do you see what I have for you through this? So when we know God, only through Jesus, When we know him, we see that he does have a plan for us. It's just to walk the narrow, difficult road that leads to life and invite as many people we can along with us. And so when we think about God and as this relationship that we get to know him as we're on this journey with him, I'm brought back to this 
this story that this marriage counselor I was reading about once shared in his marriage counseling sessions. He broke the marriage and the relationship building down to a really unique analogy that I've held on to for years now. And he said, when you're getting to know your spouse, you have a choice to make. Are you going to get your bachelor's degree, your master's degree, or your doctorate? Because if you're just in pursuit to just know them so-so and kind of have a decent, less tumultuous relationship and kind of get by, maybe a little separated, but you know that you're married and you know you care for each other, just study that spouse as if you're getting your bachelor's. Just study them to the extent that you know you can walk away and know them to some extent, and it's worth a diploma. But if you want to have a deeper relationship with them, if you want to know them in their inner being and you want to be able to walk with them through the difficult things of life or the high points or even the low points, get your masters in them. But if you truly want to know what self-sacrificial agape love looks like in marriage, the point that you know what they're thinking, everything they know, walking with them, shared experiences, being able to be completely content, riding in the car, knowing what they're thinking and never saying a word, Be ready to write your thesis and your dissertation and receive your doctorate in your spouse. So when it comes to our relationship with God, how many of us have a high school diploma? I felt like that sometimes. Right? I'm studying and getting all this practical, really um, niche experience with other things. And yet when it comes to God, I just kind of know what was shared on Sunday morning. I kind of just know what happened when I was in the building. But when I went home to do my other extracurriculars or maybe work on my homework, it didn't happen. I'm just going to show up the next Sunday and learn what I can and trust the pastor, trust the teacher. Here's the deal. Don't trust us. Every scripture that we put up there, you should be going back in your word and saying, is this true? What does this mean for my life? But if we're on this pursuit to know God, We've got to be investing our time, investing our energies in really, truly going after the one who says, I paid the price so you can have eternal life in me. Let's get to know each other. And do we shut the door and say only on Sundays or do we open up the door to our hearts and say every ounce of me deserves your focus? And so when it came to my relationship with God about eight or so years ago, I could I could rattle off all the hymns in the hymn book. I could, I could go through all of the, the confirmation exercises. I could tell you all about the religiosity of the church context that I grew up in. And I could point you to the people that I knew had a deep, deep relationship with God. But for me, I was more like at a kindergarten graduation with my handprint on the paper and two letters backwards, right? <laughs> I had all this deep desire to receive the gospel of Jesus, to know God loved me. But when it came to relationship with him, I didn't have much of one at all. And yet by his grace, he pricked my heart through a series of circumstances. And what I recognized is I had all the tools I needed to begin developing this relationship with him. A Bible, a journal, and an alarm clock. Really hard things to grab a hold of. Most of us have them all on our phone now. So we have no excuses. I even put my alarm clock down in the kitchen. You know why? Because I would snooze it if it was in my bedroom. And you should see me at 5 o'clock scrambling down the stairs trying to get to my alarm clock and shut it off before my wife and my two kids wake up. I'm not going back to sleep after that. Because my heart's beating out of my chest. But from there, I get my quiet time with Jesus. And so... Years and years ago, I began just discovering who God is through the scriptures, through other resources, through prayer, spending an hour a day at least just pursuing after God. And you know what happened? He began to speak to me. He began to teach me the things that I was reading in the scriptures. I began to understand what the the beginning books, the Tanakh of the scriptures was. I began to understand what the epistles were about and Revelation and the minor prophets and the major prophets and the redemption story of God. And did I have to go to school just to build relationship with him? No, I just had to have a hunger for him to develop that relationship with Jesus. Because when we engage his word, his written word, his logos, he begins to teach us all about his character. And his logos, his written word, becomes his voice in our hearts, his rhema. 
So when it comes to knowing God, his written word becomes his voice in our lives and our heart. And when we run into situations that are difficult to handle or you want to celebrate or you need to know that you got to go left or you go right, if we have his word meditated on our hearts and our minds and we're building this relationship with God and we're understanding him deeper and deeper, it flows within us, our response. His voice speaks to our very soul, our hearts and our minds to recognize this is his response in my life. So when it comes to knowing him, his word leads us to his voice. And imagine if we're born and we don't get the opportunity to meet our father, but for years we're told about him. We're told about how good he is and that he's around and he's coming back someday. And for now we have these letters to read about our dad. So we have this compilation of letters and they they keep coming and we keep reading and we're pouring ourselves over because we want to know who this father is of our lives and we're reading and we're underlining we're meditating we remember some of the specific lines that touched our hearts and we love them so much we hold them dear and we keep them in our bedside table at night because it's what we want to know about our father and then one night we hear the door come in and we hear a voice and our hearts soften because we say that's him Though I've never heard his voice, I know in my heart that's him. And all of a sudden, the character that was compiled on those letters comes to life in the person of our Father. That is what God has given us, is this opportunity to know him and know him and understand his character and be able to be prepared. Because when he speaks in our life, I'm telling you, it's the greatest moment we can have with him. And so the other day, it was a week ago, I had something that was really tearing me up on the inside. It was something that wasn't very important to anybody else but me, and it shouldn't even been that important to me, and I was really wrestling with it all Sunday afternoon. And I was preparing for the evening and kind of slowing down, we got the kids to bed, I was doing the dishes, and it just kept ravaging my mind of this thing. How was I going to handle it? How do I talk, who do I talk to about it? And all of a sudden, I heard this voice come out of left field in my heart that said, you're going to meet with me tonight. And as a good Christian boy should, he'd say, okay, I'm coming, Dad, I'm coming. I went to my couch and grabbed my phone. I started flipping through news feeds and social media feeds. And then this thing that I was wrestling with was getting more and more amplified, tearing me up. Anybody ever been in that spot where you're trying to medicate with white noise but this thing's not going away? Well, in an instant I realized this is not how I need to cope with this. I'm like a crazy person, I jump out of my chair, I put my sweatshirt on, put my shoes on, and my wife's like, where are you going? And I walk out the door. And I'm sure she said, he'll be back. <laughs> and as I'm walking up the driveway, all the distractions of the day are behind me back in the home. And I look up and I can see the Milky Way pace it across the sky. And I can see the fireflies and hear the peepers. And I can hear the little critters starting to scurry around as they're waking up for the nighttime. And I just realized I am in the presence of the creator. And then as I walked by this little sapling tree that's next to my driveway, I just had this moment to just sit down beneath it. And as I sat down, I closed my eyes, and I think it was about a half hour that went by, that I felt like I was truly caught up in his presence. And I'm not saying this to sound super spiritual, because years ago I would have said, this guy is absolutely crazy. It was the most profound, peaceful, indwelling presence of God that I could ever experience, and I didn't want anything else. Because when we're held in the hands of our Father, who we have relationship with, and He goes, I have you. There's nothing you need to be worried about. I've got you. I'll take care of it. And get your eyes off this world and get them on me. I'm telling you, it's the greatest experience you could ever have. But it comes from being yielded to His Word and His Scriptures. These moments are what he has for us. And there's more. I haven't cornered the market. No pastor on staff has cornered the market. Though we can live decades and decades and decades. There's teachers that confidently proclaim the gospel and preached. And it wasn't until they were retired and long gone. And no one knew of them when they said, I actually realized how I can experience the presence of God in its fullness. And so this is a journey we get to go on with him. To know him. And it's not just for us. It's for this region 
that we can look people in the eyes and say, we know God. Let me tell you about what he's done in my life. And when it doesn't come across as a printed track, but it comes across this living testimony in us and we have this joy that's incomprehensible, people pay attention. And we get to build relationships and walk with them. So one of my final points as I share this, we're going to get in some some difficult territory here in the scriptures that many of us have heard about, but I think we need to unpack them in the reality that I had shared earlier, that when it comes to knowing God, it's a matter of life or death. And when it comes to Jesus as the way to know God, we get to take the journey from death to life. Because apart from him, we are still dead in our sin. We are still separated from God, not able to build relationship with him. But when he enters our lives, he opens the gate to enter the pastures of relationship with God. And so Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 7. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. How many of us have a laundry list of achievements like prophesying in Jesus' name, driving out demons in Jesus' name, and performing miracles in Jesus' name? How many of us have that for a rap sheet? And Jesus is saying, that doesn't matter if I don't know you. This is a difficult thing to wrestle with. Jesus would have even said that. This is a difficult thing to wrestle with because he wants more than anything to know us. So if we look at this in contrast, when we come up to Jesus and say, Jesus, we didn't do all that you had asked. We didn't achieve all the things I know you wanted to. We didn't do, but I bled my heart out. I wanted nothing more than to know you. I wanted nothing more for a relationship with you. You were gracious and you spoke to me. You walked with me. We had relationship. I'm sure Jesus will say, come enter full rest in my paradise because I knew you. Doesn't matter how many church services we go to. Doesn't matter how many altar calls we've responded to. Doesn't matter if our, we've taken our first communion or our last. Doesn't matter if we've read the Bible in a year. Doesn't matter if we've served our guts out for social justice. If we don't know God, I don't know what Jesus has for us. And he makes it pretty clear here in the scriptures. But if we do know him, he has everything that's included in abundant life for us. He has everything that our soul could ever desire. He has everything for us because of relationship. And when we know him, we know the Father's will. We know what he has for us. And we're able to pursue him, know him, and live a life for him out of relationship. And this might be a little challenging too, But our spiritual life isn't segregated in the rest of our life, right? Jesus is making it very clear that your whole life has to be knowing me. And many of us might segment, well, we do our church thing, and and then we do our our gym thing, and we do our work thing, and we do our family thing, and they're all part of a well-balanced life. Jesus wants all of you. Jesus wants your mind, your heart, your body, He wants your relationships. He wants everything or nothing. Just like a father would want to know everything about you, would be able to want to walk with you through the highest of relationship celebrations to the lowest of relational deaths, through challenging times, through celebratory times. He wants to walk with us. And if we're trying to guard our hearts and keep maybe this this lifestyle, maybe living in, in sin, maybe living in a, in a life of immorality over here against God's will, and we're still trying to know him, there's a wall to our intimacy, to our knowledge, and to our relationship with God. He wants all of us. And so Jesus, as he really was closing out his earthly ministry, preparing his disciples in the latter parts of John for what was to come, his persecution, 
his trial, his crucifixion, and eventually his resurrection. Jesus prepared them for what was to come. And he plainly said, if you abide in me, I will abide in you. If you remain in me, I will remain in you. And apart from me, you can do nothing. He wants all of us. And he continues on in chapter 17 to say this. He looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. And now this is eternal life, that they know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. The gospel leads us to eternal life. Jesus was in perfect relationship with God before we ever came in the picture. And God sent him on mission to redeem us, to make us one flock, to bring us into his very presence. And Jesus is saying, I've done that, Father, and I'm unveiling what true eternal life is. It's that they may know you, the one true God. Church, the one true God. There is no other God. There is no other name. There is no other truth besides that of Jesus, the Father and his spirit that wants to live and dwell and move in our lives. This is the one true God, and Jesus says, glorify your name. And he was glorified on the day that Jesus rose from the grave and said, I have defeated sin, death, and hell once and for all. Because on that cross, it was finished. And so today, maybe people are locked in this reality of guilt and shame of you don't know what I've done. He doesn't want to have relationship for me, with me. If he didn't, Jesus wouldn't have taken on your sin and my sin. But he bore that weight. He bore the shame that came from the one and only, the one true son whose God's face was turned from. As he hung on that cross and he said, it is finished. That's the price he paid for you and I. And I pray it lifts any burden of shame off your shoulders. I pray it pulls any weight that you might feel because God looks at you as this father that says, come on home. Run home to me. Because eternal life isn't in this distant future. The kingdom of God isn't some place to achieve or see at the end of this life. The kingdom of God is near and eternal life is now if we know Jesus. There is no other gift that is greater than the ability to know God. And there is no other ground we can stand on when we share the gospel with Greater Portland. The fact that we know God. It changes everything. And so as we really take a look and what even communion is for us. When we look at the reality that this was a paid price by God in flesh, the Alpha and the Omega came after you and you and you and you. He came after all of us that sit here today. He came after all of Greater Portland. And he had to pay a price. Are we willing to receive it today. Don't do this out of, this is what we do at East Point. Do this out of a receiving of a gift that nobody else can give you. And if you have to pause and maybe pass today because you have to wrestle with the fact, do I actually know him? Do I actually believe this? That's okay. But for those of us who do, for those of us who need to run back to our Father, for those of us who need to take that next step with Jesus and start pursuing Him in a deeper way through His Word and by His Spirit, may we commit to Him by taking communion today. Saying, Jesus, we receive Your gift so that I can enter into eternal life in knowing the one true God. So that last night as He was preparing His disciples for what was to come, He took the bread and He said, This is my body broken for you. Take it, eat it in remembrance of me. In the same way he took the cup. And I want to say this, this is good news that Jesus through his son 
that God through his son Jesus paid the price. Final atonement that by his blood, by his wounds, we are healed. So when we take the cup, we are healed in Jesus' name. Drink the cup with me. Let me pray for us. Oh, Father, we recognize that some of this can be really difficult to grapple with. But I pray by your spirit that you lead every individual in this room, every mind, heart, and soul into a place, even this afternoon, to wrestle with you in understanding what it means to have relationship with you. That God, you don't let them go until they realize what their next step is to follow you with their entire life. Father, forgive us when we walk away from you. Forgive us when we choose things other than you, when we make idols out of this life and we don't take up you as the one true God, the one who has eternal life in his hands. And thank you for your gracious, merciful gift in your son Jesus. And may we come back to you with our shoulders back, our chins held high, knowing that we as sons and daughters can enter into your pastures of grace and mercy and life and life abundant because we have entered through the gate that is Jesus. May we know you deeper. May we experience eternal life and your kingdom coming in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you all join me in worship? Speak in vain, a syllable 
One of, the, one of the great things we can do in this life to say, hey, we're walking through the gate into your pasture, Jesus, is baptism. And so we have a couple people that we didn't really have a whole plan for to baptize, but they've just come forward and said, today's the day. Today's the day to give my life to Jesus, declare him as Lord. And so Noella gets to be baptized. Big shout out to her aunt, Olive, who's here, who introduced her to this church family three years ago. And today, Noella declares that Jesus is Lord. So good, so good, so good, okay. And surprise, we've got a mom, Allison and her daughter Kayla getting baptized as well. So they're coming down. This is new life that God gives us. This is new, new people that are turning their lives over to Jesus and saying, I want to know your father, Jesus. I want abundant life. I want to experience what you have for me. And just through baptism, if you want to get baptized today, there's a curtain right down there. We'll meet you. We'll meet you to be baptized. Don't wait. 
And so this is Allison and her little daughter, Kayla, and they get to declare that Jesus is Lord through baptism themselves today as well. Hey, Kayla. Oh. Amen. Hey, Amen. Kayla, can I get a high five? Hey, can I get a high five? Awesome. That's life. And if so, if there's anybody that wants to be baptized, anybody that wants to say, today's the day, I want to know God, I want to get closer to Him, let's start with baptism. Let's walk with you in discipleship, get you plugged into community, and begin that journey together. Because knowing God is eternal life, period. And so we thank Him for that. We thank you for being here, church. May we exemplify this value even this afternoon as we pursue both Jesus and this region for the gospel. So have a great afternoon, have a great week, and we'll see you next week as we dive into Find Freedom.